Oh, hi, it's Zach Peter, your new favorite pop culture guru, serving you the hottest tea three times a week. From the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, unfiltered convos with your favorite stars, and of course, the latest from Vanderpump Land, I've got you covered. And new episodes of the podcast are now available in video on Spotify. And they don't just let anybody do video, but this platinum blonde has won them over. So if you want the latest news from the ultimate tea spilling professional, tune in to No Filter with Zach Peter. That's No Filter with Zach Peter on your favorite podcast app now. Welcome to the Story Worthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Finn. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannah Spinney, and we're coming to you from Holcomb, Kansas. Holcomb, Kansas is where the crimes took place that Truman Capote wrote about in his 1959 book, in cold blood. Ooh, see that's eerie right there. As yes. soon as you go in cold blood, the whole tone sets. It's like an eerie thing going on. It is. It's eerie. We have candles burning. There are uh, spiders, plastic spiders. We hope uh, set into sort of a th- <laughs> things in the wall to make shadows. It's really hard to read our notes. All right, here's so what's happening, eerie, you guys. We have a storyteller tonight. She brings forth the subject true crime. True crime. True now that, crime. Well, but it's not just true crime, and it's not just like, well, it's an interesting background. It's it's obviously a serious topic, but it's a topic that has just gained so much well, popularity lately. Yes, it and is. And there seems to be like an old genre of it, like kind of like the Sherlock Holmes back in England kind of no, thing. No, no, no. And but then that, the newer well, no, thing. No, not Sherlock Holmes. Like you mean Jack the Ripper. Jack. Those, well, then there's those that, obsessions about who who was Jack the right, Ripper? Right, but the who new he... but the new thing is more like John Benet Ramsey, OJ Simpson, Elizabeth Smart. I mean, now we're getting into like people want to know the psyches behind the people that are committing the crimes. It's not just about the victim anymore. Right, people are yeah, well people I guess have always been fascinated by crime, but it's like now people just want to know every horrible horrible detail oh, about God. the crime and about the phone calls made before the crime and it's like uh, what, who is that guy on Dateline NBC? Stone Phillips? Stone he owns his Phillips. Whole car- his whole career is based on true crime as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's very interesting. And our guest tonight, Michelle McNamara, she actually has contributed to Dateline NBC. Honest. Oh, I did not know that. Yes, and I'm Look sure it's, it must references. be in a true crime fashion. But she has, a, she has a, her own website called True Crime Diary. Dot com. Oh. And it's a website des- designated, designated to true crime, but not just... Um, not just the wild stuff, like not just like John Wayne Gacy or, you know, not just the... Not the biggest names. Not the biggest names. A lot of times it's more about unsolved crimes. Yes, yes, that is. A, yeah, that's another whole thing. Yeah, people love the unsolved crimes. There's a whole group of people I know, like literally people like forensics, like pathologists and detectives. There is a, a group of them and they get together for lunch like once a month in, I'm going to say, New York. Some play maybe Chicago, but probably New York, and they present. And one of the, somebody will present a unsolved, a major unsolved crime to them. Yeah, and they will try and solve it. Well, but there's even a television show now. I can't remember the name of it, but where they take college kids and they, you know, like it's their season or their their semester. Jersey project. Shore, I believe it's called Jersey Shore. <laughs> Desperate Housewives of NYU. And- Desperate Housewives of <laughs> Dead Desperate Housewives of the Morgue. Made no which sense. Which could be the best show ever. Were you into on. crime when you were little? Like, were you into true crime and Not stuff? Not true like crime, that? no. I'm a totally a fictional crime guy. Raymond Chandler, Dashiell oh, right. Hammett. That's who I that's who I like. I didn't like to think that there was actually crime taking place. Interesting, interesting. Now, see, I did, because one of my favorite things was being spooked or being haunted, and I have four older sisters and an older brother, and we would like to tell ghost stories, and, you know, there was the guy that lived down the street, and along the end of his driveway, there were two, you know, those that's kind of thing where there's a tone set. Yeah, you like that, and yet you cannot watch a black and white movie because the people in it are dead. That's exactly right. That, that I don't, I do. so you're haunted by Casablanca more and than antiques. the sight of a disembodied head. And antiques, so what? 
Yeah. And Hannes teach, always right. likes to go back to my, my problems. This isn't about me, Hannes. No, it's all about you. Uh, well, that's true. It is my show. But the fact of the matter is, true crime. Here's where I got interested. When I was a kid, my mother wanted me to read more. Um, and she would put around the house books that were about mm, hauntings, psychics, murders, things that were probably not appropriate for a 10 year old. But of course, then I wanted that to read that because yeah. so she would leave things around. And then Good job. what it really started were the Stephen King books. No. And she led around the house, uh, Carrie and Thinner and some of those early works, The Shining. It. It, oh my gosh. To this day, honest, I remember reading It in college and having to like read at night in my bedroom by flashlight. I always read by flashlight. But then I would have to, at some point in the book, have to turn all the lights on, turn on the TV, watch some Johnny Carson. That's how old I am. Yes. And then forget about the movie. Otherwise, I would have to dreams of dead clowns coming out of the storm drain. <laughs> the point is, my just, mother knew just, that by leaving out books that were tempting, interesting, she probably should have left some sex books out. That would have done me a lot of good, to tell you the truth. But maybe some, uh, some, yeah, some books saying, hey, maybe don't have sex with everybody. Thanks a lot, Hannes. What? Anyway, the point that was is, a, an earlier podcast. This is chronicled. about true crime, not right. true, you know. True sex. Not true See, sex. I would be much more likely to true sex. Sex would have been my, uh, yeah, I don't like the, I just have to say, I don't like uh, the, you know, hearing the details of like, oh, yes, they murdered like a thousand people. And I'm like, I, I have too vivid, an, I had too vivid an imagination as a child to be. Why? What was your, what were you imagining as a I'm, child? Uh, no, I'm obsessive compulsive, which I didn't know at the time. So it's like, if I heard a horrible true story on the news, I would think about it about a hundred thousand times. Wow. And then eventually I would think about what if it happened to me. Oh, wow. Okay. As opposed to, uh, you know, like your Raymond Chandler. Sure, there's people dying, but there's a lot of fedoras and a lot of whiskey drinking right. and a lot of uh, cynicism. But this is and happening and it's the... happening now. And there could be a boogeyman under your bed. All right, look, we have a real storyteller here. And she is going to tell us a story entitled True Crime. And she knows a lot about it. So I think... Hopefully she's going to tell a story and not commit a cr true crime. That's what I'm hoping. But as a, like a meta sort of commentary on storytelling, if she like stabbed us instead of... And, and created a story that other people had told. That would be like that would be kind of awesome. Except and we for might being stabbed. get good ratings on iTunes. And that That's seems true, to be what because, it boils down uh, yeah, to. Yeah, sex sells and murder sells. And if only, if only we would get murdered now, then maybe people would go to Amazon.com through our website, storyworthypodcast.com, right. click on our banner. Right. If you need ad. to buy butcher knives for whatever reason, That's what I'm go saying. to Amazon.com or go through our website so That's that we I'm get saying. a few shekels to make money off of podcast. your com. horrific crime. Well, honestly, though, Hannes, as I've said before, it works for us. It truly works, and I'm very grateful to each and every person work. who does, does that. Work. So there you go. People do that. They, they, right. they, they, people do it. Do it again. All right, let's turn down the lights. Let's put on the candles and get ready for Michelle McNamara. Shotgun Storyworthy is back! This Wednesday, April 11th at El Cid in Silver Lake. The show begins at 7.30 p.m. Yes, and our judges are comedian Jimmy Dore and moth producer Carrie Armstrong. So we'll see you there this Wednesday night at El Cid in Silver Lake. Why am I shouting? I don't know! I'm Joe Slupsky, the unpaid intern, and you are listening to Storyworthy. And we're back. Uh, we have technically left the township of Holcomb, Kansas. We're in our mobile unit that we record from, and we're, we've, we've actually got a flat tire. We're stuck on the side of the road. It's a moonless night, and it's very, very dark out here in the plains of Kansas. Anything could be hiding in the wheat fields. What are those footsteps? Oh, Cut. it's just Rush Limbaugh. Oh. Cut. Cut. Now, that would be terrifying right there, Hannes. Yeah, if exactly. Rush Limbaugh was in the dark in the middle of a field in Kansas, that would be... I mean, he's terrifying anyway. That, but if all of a sudden he just showed up, Jesus. What if, yeah. Imagine <laughs> Rush Limbaugh coming out of a storm drain. Forget, oh about the, forget about the clowns. Oh, my Lord. That is actually... <laughs> I'm coming to the storm drain. Wait, I'm stuck. Okay, Hannes, have you ever gotten into... I mean, besides... I mean, I, we were talking true crime, but I mean like the latest ones, like that guy Josh Powell, who recently murdered his two children as well as his wife last year. Like, do you follow that or you don't even... I hear about it. Um, I, I, you know, you know very well that my opinion of human beings is very low in the first place. So it right. really doesn't help me 
to lower it any further by listening to the worst people in the world. However, I'm very excited to hear this story. So am I. All right, you guys, she's here. Let's do a little bio info. Oh, let's do that, shall we? Uh, Michelle McNamara, she's a writer and a web sleuth. That, I don't know what that means. Do you know what that means, web sleuth? A sleuth sleuth is a detective. Okay, good. Uh, She has taught college writing. That's a good thing. Uh, Worked as an editor, sold TV pilots, and also consulted for Dateline. See, those are the folks that show the programs about women getting stabbed and murdered. Yes, not only women, but really almost entirely women. I can't women. get enough of and that. And by the way, you better be an attractive woman. Because if you're an uggo, we well, don't give a not shit gonna, We're not going to put you on murdered. Dateline is what's yeah, going to happen exactly. there. Uh, all right, you guys. She has a website, True Crime Diary, where she blogs about unsolved crimes. Now, the most appealing thing about mysteries for her is the chance to solve them. That's interesting, Hannes. She's a sleuth, sleuthsayer. Is that a word? That is not. That is not. You have put Gosh, together. Darn it. A soothsayer is a person Gosh, who is uh, has, I believe, ESP, and a sleuth is a detective, usually uh, a cartoon beagle w- dressed up as <laughs> uh, as Sherlock Holmes, aka Snoopy. All right, you in, guys. Uh, let's get excited. Let's get scared, and put your hands together for Michelle McNamara. <laughs> I handled my first crime scene evidence the summer I was 14, specifically broken pieces from a yellow Walkman, a Walkman that 48 hours earlier had been in the ears of Kathy Lombardo. We knew the Lombardo family from our parish church, St. Edmunds. Kathy was 10 years older than me, too big a gap to really know well, but the general impression was that she was a straight arrow girl, a shy pleaser. It was August 1984. Corey Hart's Sunglasses at Night was everywhere. I loved the song. It was the perfect anthem for a 14-year-old girl about to enter high school who spent her time scanning for signs of what it meant to be cool. We lived in Oak Park, just west of Chicago. Native Ernest Hemingway famously called the town of wide lawns and narrow minds. But truthfully, the lawns weren't that wide. And by the 1980s, Oak Park had a reputation for a kind of privileged liberalism, progressive at a remove. Imagine tasteful prairie-style homes filled with Northwestern graduates who put in two years in the Peace Corps before law school. Kathy Lombardo probably wasn't into sunglasses at night. She was more likely a stuck-on-you-by-Lionel-Ritchie kind of person, another song big in 1984. Maybe she'd been listening to it when the moment occurred, the moment that led to my furtive handling of her broken Walkman, the moment when she'd been jogging a block and a half from her family's house and a man's hands shot forth suddenly in the darkness. There was the shock of his hands and the brutal force with which he brought her down, dragging her into the alley, away from the prairie homes and the cozy summer post-dinner wine get-togethers on the screened porches, slamming her into the garbage cans where he raped Kathy, stabbed her, slit her throat, then disappeared. I remember it was very hot. I was on the third floor in the refurbished attic bedroom with the orange shag rug that was decorated in the various styles of my five older siblings who had all been teenagers in the 1970s. I remember rustling and a commotion. I remember knowing just from the way my mother and sister stood looking out the second floor window that something terrible had happened. Terrible things never happened. I felt in the truest sense of the word gripped, like an unseen force had locked onto me, refusing to let go. Kathy Lombardo's murder gripped everyone in open park those last weeks of summer 1984 word was that her killer had gotten off the l train the train that brought back the lawyers and bankers from the city he'd exited the train spotted kathy jogging and followed her near the l stop in question was a convenience store the white hand pantry and for years i associated the store and the l stop and the section of tunneled street under the train that shook and was dark with dread foreboding the awful charged instant an animal spots its prey By fall, talk of Kathy's murder and aberration inflicted on us from the outside faded, but not for me. I was still gripped. In fact, I was changed. I was a 14-year-old in tree-torn sneakers who sneaked away not to smoke cigarettes or see a boy, but to an alcove in an alley 0.3 miles from my house where I searched and found and handled the broken pieces of a Walkman that had belonged to a murdered girl. Never again would I tune out when the words homicide or missing or mystery came on the news. I greedily collected details of true crimes, big and small. I spent hours lying on my side in bed, poring over true crime books. I had a murder habit, and it was bad. I would feed it for the rest of my life. I've spent a lot of time thinking about why. For many reasons, the fascination makes no sense. I'm extraordinarily squeamish about visual depictions of violence and frequently have to leave the room at what many would consider mild episodes of physical roughness on TV. I don't fall defiantly on one side of the justice versus mercy question. No one in my family has murdered or been murdered. 
I think the narcotic pull for me is what I think of as the powerful absence that haunts an unsolved crime. Murderers lose their power the moment we know them. We see their unkempt shirts, the uncertain fear tightening their faces as they're led into a courtroom. You know their names now, and it's often just Dave. But if you commit a brutal murder and then vanish, what you leave behind isn't just pain but absence, a great supreme blankness that triumphs obscenely, it seems to me, over everything else. When I'm puzzling over the details of an unsolved crime, I'm like a rat in a maze given a task. And I mean that in the best possible way. The world narrows. The search propels. I trace my obsession to the moment in the alley with the pieces of Walkman when I was 14. Kathy Lombardo was gone. She wasn't coming back. But he, whomever, whomever he was, was still out there. The hollow gap of his identity was violently powerful to me. I wanted to see his face. I wanted to know who he was. As it turns out, I may have known him all along. 27 years after the murder, I called the cold case detective in charge of Kathy Lombardo's still unsolved case. I wanted to write about the story, and I had some questions. I casually mentioned the fact that the killer had been spotted exiting the L and following Kathy. Don't know where you got that, he said. Never happened. We decided someone in the neighborhood had probably started the rumor to perpetuate the idea that the threat came from outside Oak Park. In fact, clues point to the killer as someone who probably lived close by, someone who may have been a familiar face. Who was he? In the maze, the world narrows, the search propels. On August 1st, 1984, a man who showed one face to the world had someone else crouched inside him, as many people do. Someone coiled and seething, waiting to spring, listening for the approaching footsteps of a girl jogging by in the dark. (laughs) That is a crazy story. I don't think I've ever met anybody that knew somebody murdered at that age. Yeah, it was, um, it was intense for sure. And she was your friend. Well, it was a family friend. It was like, it was like, she was like 24. Yeah, she was 24. 10 years older. We knew my, she was my sister's friend. We knew the family. You're the youngest of six. I'm the youngest of six. Oh, are you? Yeah. I thought when you said that you're older. Yeah. And my sisters also, everybody was, grew up in the seventies and everybody, you know, that was, I was the youngest and kind of listening to them, listening to the Beatles and Neil Diamond and the monkeys. Yeah. A lot of eagles. A lot of eagles. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a little <laughs> later, but sure enough. Uh, so this is interesting. What happened after you found that Walkman? Oh. Yeah, well, that wasn't something you had to turn over to the No, cops. no. I mean, it had already been a crime scene, and I was just going, and kind of, I knew where she had been But killed. how could they have not taken a piece of it? Oh, I, that was back when they did. Did you it turn it in? It was very pre-CSI. No. Yeah. No. Did you feel like it was truly a piece of her Walkman, or maybe it could have been something else? I don't know, but it definitely was. I knew she was wearing a Walkman, and it was right where she had been killed. And so. when, you call, when you call the detective on this cold case... You say, hi, my name is Michelle McNamara, and I would, what did you say? Well, something like that. I mean, I call detectives a lot because I do kind of traditional reporting on stuff. And I so, see. and they're used to getting calls from, you know, writers and stuff all the time. So they're not. Why, why would you not be a crime analyst? Well, um, I'm, I don't, because it's not as interesting to me. Law enforcement in general is, from what I know, not actually all it's sort of made to be out to be. I mean, I think you have to deal with a lot of In other words, there's only BS. five people really solving crimes and everybody else is pushing papers. Right, right. And I just, I, it never really appealed to me. Well, um, wait, you can't say it never appealed to you. <laughs> well, no, you but in that sense. Well, the reality of police work, which is uh, very just, mundane. Right, I see. right. For the being most in, part. Being in vice for five years or something. You know, I mean, I don't know that I would have been a good I don't I, and I'm a little a little bit more of like an offbeat thinker and I don't think that really like you have to be kind of a group thinker and when well, to be a cop to yeah. television uh, even though you're not in the police, you could be like the mentalist or Castle, a consultant to the police. Oh, with I your see. You're offbeat thinking. You know what? And helping I'm to friends solve with crimes. Poppy Montgomery, and Poppy is on the show um, Unforgettable, and she yes. solves crime because she remembers. She crimes, solves crime with her uh, hot body and I was her tiny, say, tiny also, tank top. She's so damn could, hot. Could yeah, not. She she's so curvy. Dress, it's ridiculous. I know it's uh, she's she's a ridiculous, girl. but she couldn't dress. Less like a person with a job, let alone a cop. Listen, I... She doesn't dress like she's even been in a fucking <laughs> office in her life. Poppy is one of those women who she just always looks hot, so no matter what she's wearing. Trust me, I know her. I no, 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 I believe right you. I, mean, I saw I, her yeah. once. I know she, her neighbor, her 
so what, was your yeah, neighbor. The point Whatever. is, it's all she's Hollywood. always hot. She's just hot. Yeah, I know, but Let me anyhow, ask you that's this not show. the point. But, but the thing with the police is, I will say, I mean, they are actually very open to talking to me a lot of times because of these cold cases. They need publicity and information. Interesting. And so I have almost never had anyone like not give me info. I have a really good rapport with them. And do, so. do you think because now you're calling back certain departments and they know your name, or do you say, hello, my name is Michelle McNamara with True Crime Diary? Yeah, some of them know who I am because it's, we've had conversations in the past but sometimes they don't. But. Okay, so my question is, why don't you have a podcast for this? Well, I kind of started to do it, um, and I I just, I have to find more, like, I like the interactive aspect, like, of what you guys are doing, and I really didn't ha- I kept having, it's like a long story. But the but. tone of you, the way you tell a story, the tone is so enticing. It's just like, I just want to get closer and closer, like, and then what? Right, and right. Then, yes, and I want to hear a, a saxophone in the back. <laughs> no, but as, it's, it's uh, a Robert beautiful, Mitchum smokes like a cigarette around yeah, the corner I mean, by Indian Light. Yeah, it almost seems like we're not talking about real people. It's almost like you're talking about mythical people, but these things happen. Well, right. that's the weird thing about, like, you see this, it's like, I mean, Oak Park, I've, I, uh, I'm from Milwaukee, right. and we'll talk about that later, because Milwaukee is <laughs> always fascinating, but <laughs> And he like, always has to mention Oak it in this Park show. Oak is Park is a very nice, staid suburb, and, and much like the one that I went to high school in, it's like, but we had a murder, like, at a store, and it really does seem like it comes out of nowhere. Right. And of course, you do think, well, it's some unsavory element. But yeah, you always forget people are faking it most of the time. Right. All those people, you know, I, all those people I went to high school with who had really, you know, I live in an apartment and they had big houses. And I was like, oh, they're living fabulous lives. Well, their parents may have been more successful than my parents, but most people are faking it. Right. Like, no, 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 I'm really, yes, I like to go to brunch. And we have we have repertory tickets, and we go to the symphony, and we do. Which it, but it's like reminds me of the, just, of the life of the of the uh, Menendez brothers, uh, Eric and Lyle. Did that ever attract that that case? Yeah, that interest I mean, you? It, it didn't attract me. I, I tend to like for whatever. It, maybe it's just a knee jerk reaction. But if something's like so overly saturated in the news, I mm-hmm. tend not to get that interested in. And they seem so obviously guilty that th- it has to have an element of mystery what for about, me to be yeah, interested I see in. What you're uh, John Benet Ramsey. Well, in terms no, of mystery, I mean, if you is, have a week, we could talk about that because I, <laughs> I well, no, but the mystery aspect of that is unbelievable well I mean it's the weirdest it's, case that anybody like in in vet, any investigative ever talked about hands down the strangest most mysterious case that's ever happened no because kidding. usually yes. I believe from what I know about true crime is it's like the whole well you were talking about the way tell the way television portrays police work and the way it really is in reality it is almost always exactly who you think it is you right. know it's almost always the husband of the wife or the ex-girlfriend, or somebody. It's like not the, a serial the killer, no, 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 not no, a serial no, no, killer, no, no, dude. No, serial killers are, I mean, are terrible. Well, that's what we're talking about. The, well, no, not necessarily. Ta- no, you're right. No, you're right. In this yeah. case, we're talking about usually if a young woman was murdered, right? It would be her jilted boyfriend, right? The cops, ninety-nine percent right. of the time, from what I've what I've what I've seen on television, that's got to be true, right? Is like it's the first person they think of. And then they go after that guy and he and he breaks. But it's when it's not that person, that's when it's weird. It's not a big percentage. But I then see, it's right, like, right. it's way off the charts if it's not the person you think of immediately. Right. Like, in other words, let's go to Scott Peterson because this guy <laughs> who is now in San Quentin for life, would you ever have an interest, Michelle, in going to San Quentin and interviewing him or talking to him? Do you have a fascination about him at all? Well, no, only because I also don't have a, a fascination so much with like the ones that have already been, like, I'm not so much like, like what's going on in their mind. It's really just like, it's it's like the mystery puzzle part of it. I like to unravel that. I see. But once they're caught, like I wouldn't write a book, for instance, like about Ted Bundy because I'm he's not. He's dead. He's dead. And like, yeah. I'm not that interested in what made yeah, him move Or on. is he living right. with Tupac on an island? <laughs> no, but it's true. It's like, move on, you know? Who was the guy that ate everybody? Who was he? Ed Gein? No. Oh, Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Michelle, from you're the only Milwaukee. person. Where's Jeffrey oh, Dahmer from? you could, don't even, <laughs> like. Ed Gein? Where's Ed Gein from? Michelle's Wisconsin. the only person you know I know. It's a cocktail party trick of mine for someone to bring up the town they're from, and I will name the unsolved crime. Oh, that is a terrific. Yeah. Pittsburgh, just, Pennsylvania. Okay. Oh, well, okay. But there's a couple, definitely a couple in Pennsylvania. Wait. Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. That's okay. terrific. There's um, what a talent. Well, there's Latrobe. There's like a very crazy one. Rolling with Lepro- Rock beer. 
Um, yes, but St. Vincent's College, because my ex-boyfriend went there. But there's there's some there's a couple of missing uh, girl situations in uh, in th- in that area. And what else is in Pennsylvania? I don't know. Well, let me ask you about Scott Peterson. This okay. guy was so brazen. Somebody's obsessed with right? Scott Peterson. By the way, she has a poster of him on her wall. No, I have a right. poster of Rafael Nadal, and he is alive and hot. And my yeah. boyfriend. Yeah, he's pretty hot. Yeah. Sure. He anyway, doesn't seem Rafael like a sociopath. If shows up dead, we know where to come. We're coming to you. <laughs> He's also a much harder worker than Scott Peterson. Scott but Peterson put absolutely no work in that in that whole <laughs> in the he plan. Was, yes, in the plan. Here's the thing: is like Scott Peterson's not that interesting to me because I think he's not very bright. I think he was. My fascination with these crimes are that people often go. Um, how could they have done all that stupid stuff? We have to remember is when people did the crime, there's no way they thought they'd become the Lacey and Scott Peterson case because so many, there's like a dime, a dozen of those kind of cases that happen all the time and they never make the news. Right. So they don't know that, you know, they don't know that their every move is going to be. So why did that make the news? What burst that open? It was uh, the holidays. It, yeah, it she was pregnant. Eve. She was pretty. It's you have like an eighty. To, I've seen the statistics. You have like an eighty percent higher chance of being in the news if it's around the holidays. Wow! And um, wow. The, it's just. I mean, it just goes to show right. you what like. And also, I mean, and by the way, the police they're ju- they get juice from stuff that's in the news. So that so uh, crimes get solved because they get attention. So yeah. it's really and it sad. Does, and actually, the attractive. I mean, we made the joke, but yeah, if you're oh. attractive, and frankly, if you know you're an unusual crime victim like you know then not to get all political but this trevon martin thing because yeah. somebody was finally able to make a giant stink we heard about it but the news is not going to be like oh a 17 year old black kid was killed in florida they don't give a shit right a right. white girl is killed one white girl is killed in the bahamas or wherever oh, yeah. those white girls get killed yeah yeah that, <laughs> no, no 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 there's a you know what's no, her I name i hear what you're saying uh, natalie holloway but let but me wait, ask- one other thing about scott peterson that i think is interesting is my, i'm also a big believer in that once you sort of like scrape away there's always more to the story and with scott peterson is always like oh he's this like handsome traveling salesman who seemed to love his wife why did he do this if you really read into it a little bit. Right. There was stories that way back from when he they had, first started dating that he was like way off the charts in the psychopath test. I, I mean, see. he, you know, like, we had had many affairs. Yeah. But the thing with Amber Fry was, was very so bold. cold. Like the it, thing with Amber Fry though, his, his mistress yeah, was so yeah. bold. I mean, she, he had told her, yeah, I lost my wife. I know. Well, that's the not very and there was only, part. But there's only a little bit of circumstantial evidence. I believe like, just like a hair off of a screwdriver in his boat or something. Yeah, no, it is actually surprising that he got, so he was convicted. really convicted off of what do you call that? Um, hearsay. No, not what do you call that? When it's well, not circumstantial, it's well, no, and it, it was circumstantial it because it's not. It, there's no forensic evidence, but he was recorded talking to Amber, if I'm remembering correctly, saying some very well, and also he was fishing. Himself. He was yeah. fishing in the place where her body was found, and he was found uh, about five miles from the border with his hair dyed, fifteen thousand dollars, and. Uh, something i mean there was he like viagra. he was, he was on the run yeah, yeah he I mean, you really was. have to wonder if oh, if it had not been a giant news story if there had not been that much pressure on it if they, they would have been able to get a stalemate a hung jury and then he would have got away with it yeah he may not have even been arrested let I mean. me ask you this michelle so let's go back to a podcast about this because mm-hmm. if you really think that you you're in, in interested in uh, the puzzle of it and and putting pieces together and finding people right then if you did a podcast you might really do a good thing i mean right you might help well, through the website i have i mean there's been cases that i've come there's one true crime diary.com right i've i sort of like the one that i had got me the most attention was a couple years ago this kid was kidnapped and it was a very high profile story and i said i wrote a post that said i think the same whoever did this kidnapped this other kid five years earlier that no one was connecting the two, but I, there was a lot of things about it that just seemed similar to me. And I said, I think whoever took this kid, Ben Honeby took Sean Horn, Horn. Yeah. I whatever. remember that kid. I remember, and yeah. And that I posted true. on a Tuesday and Friday they had a tip and they went to the door and Sean answered the door. I remember that And so like story. Geraldo called, cause people were like, are you a psychic? How did you know this? And I was like, it's like having sports facts in my head. So like I'm just one of those so people that has. Instri- you have murderers in your head. Yeah. I mean, I can, oh, I Michelle, just, it's like, Jesus. it's all in my head. It's, yeah. It's, it, it does seem a little odd that that is your hobby. I, know. I can't explain it. Wait a minute. Did, 
did you come to life from a Stephen King novel? <laughs> I suddenly see that you were you know actually I mean? like, a living character. I have always enjoyed the macabre, and you know, I love Stephen King, obviously, and I love. You know, I love the Dateline. I love the rape children in a field. I don't right. know why. But see, but I don't even really like the Stephen King. Like, I kind of do, but it has to be real. It has to be real. Yeah. I like non Yeah, Supernatural yeah. doesn't... The O.J. Simpson doesn't thing. thing. You thought of that what? You thought... Well, I was fascinated because we're watching, like, the public open figure shut. melt down. Yeah, I mean, he's guilty. Yeah, yeah it's not, right. that's not a question. I, I won't get into it. I have controversial... Uh, thoughts on the John Bonet thing that it's going it would be take too much time but I, I won't go into that because maybe I, you could come back another time and we'll just do the whole podcast we'll uh, call it John Bonet Ramsey that's my dream okay here's what here's what, yeah, that is your dream to come back here <laughs> here come back here in, the, in our palatial studio to, to talk into a microphone about John Bonet Ramsey is a dream. I would oh, boy. actually I would but love that you know what here's here's okay here's how it's gonna go down we're you're gonna your persona of you and your real name, you know how Bones yeah. is based on a real paleontologist or pa- right. pathologist or whatever? Yeah. All right. The fictionalized version of you with your name, played by Poppy Montgomery, <laughs> helping the Los Angeles Police Department with a ridiculously handsome detective wow, partner. Wow, I love it. That's and perfect. And you will be solving, you'll be solving crimes. Yeah. This oh, is fantastic. Wow. This Could- is this is a money machine. Could we machine. cast Ryan Gosling? I mean, as long as we're throwing it out there. No, no, no. He doesn't do television. Okay, how about Raphael Nadal? No, no. I'm thinking maybe <laughs> Benjamin Bratt. I will no. say the one thing that I do that I think is helpful is that I'm, I've am i been shocked when I first started blogging at, at how little law enforcement uses the internet. I, there would be murder cases when I would be like, oh, well, did you know that this person's blog said they had that weird thing about the piano teacher? And they were like, what? In other I mean, words, people it, are actually not, posting facts before. People live online now. Yeah. I mean, your whole life is online. They're not looking at each other saying. Not looking online. Yeah. Well, they were, How can that be? Because they're, it's a diff- it hopefully is going to generationally switch. San Francisco PD just got email three years ago. Oh, my God. I mean, it's shocking. It's Do like, you think that the detectives <laughs> then are like... Um, no, they're, I'll tell you, well, they're you Jerry they're, Orbach on, on yeah, Law and Order. Yeah, like, right, going. These goddamn <laughs> kids with their email, I tell you, you solve it through. Uh, Total Lenny Briscoe. It's I just know, old but, school. But like, I don't want to look on a blog. That they're just they're giving out the orders like McGarrett on 5 when he would say, you know, James, you run to the so and so, and Chin, you do this, and then I'll sit back and wait for the phone. Are you saying they're just throwing out orders, or are they really interested no, in being I, detectives? They are interested no, in being they're detectives. They're, they're not just doing it like it's 1940. Right. They're oh, using see, the old I techniques. See. So they're not actually using the equipment, right. the technology that we have today. They don't quite realize wow. that I mean, how yeah. stupid how people are online be? and how people commit crimes and probably posted something but like, that wow, are... murdering that guy was hard on my tennis elbow. I mean, I could find out just about anything about anyone that I, know, I know. People that are 30 or 35 grew up on the internet. You realize that? Yes. So you're saying there's no 35-year-old detectives? Well, no, they they just start to become detectives around that age. So it's just, I'm just talking the last yeah, couple no, years. I don't think it's there's just any 30-year-old detectives. Well, Michelle, we need to get you a job because you're so interested and focused. We need to somehow get this narrowed into a, 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 you know, a vehicle for you. Well, I've been in a lot of meetings to try to, you know, to make this into, you know, TV show and all this kind of stuff. It just, it gets a little like... Because the thing is, because it's on the internet, it's a little passive. It's not, doesn't, you don't have shots of me like running around with a gun. So it can't. All right. Have you but held I, a gun? Have okay, you held a gun? You, you no. Um, and I don't want to do that. I don't, don't want to. Like, I'm all right. Gun. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. You are, it's called Facebook and the lady. All right. You're <gasps> I the like lady. It. And you have a partner who understands, played by the fat guy from Lost, of because course. that Alcatraz oh thing is going to get canceled. God. I saw him and in Trader Joe's one time. You guys solve crimes using the internet, and you have a very old detective played by. <laughs> uh, okay. Once uh, well, No, Mark Harmon, once NCIS goes off, and he's like, Kids, I you know, every time you come in and say, listen, we found a guy's blog. I don't want to hear about your <laughs> blogs. He's smoking a cigar. He's like, go out and put some footwork, you know, put some uh, f- shoe leather into it. Facebook I, and the lady. I like it. I, like I really it. like, I like it. it. Michelle, you're so interesting. It's really, Thank seriously, you. you just start talking about true crime and I just want to go to a slumber party with a flashlight <laughs> and a tent in the backyard and I just want to get scared the shit out of me. You know what I mean? Make I love that stuff. Yeah. In the shape. Real well, quick, we sadly, gotta... people are always going to be murdered, so I'll always have things to talk oh, about. Oh, wow, but, wow. Yeah. You're like a funeral director <laughs> of true crime. 
Yeah, um, Hannes, true. we got to wrap this up, but I want to ask Michelle real quick. What about Josh Powell, this guy recently? Oh, God. Psychopath. See, now that, that awful person. Even, would it inter- interest you or no? Because he was so crazy and it's over. He No, I mean, he was so crazy. It's kind of interesting because he was so Tell awful. everybody what he did. He just was this um, guy who killed his wife, very clearly killed his wife, but dis- she was disappeared. But then he did this really, it just makes me feel awful. He did this awful thing with about his two kids that he had them dropped off the social worker, shut the door, and then the house blew up. It was like something out of a law and, and order. Not yeah, only that, he... a Jerry, I hate Jerry Bruckheimer crimes in real life. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh, come on. You had to blow the house yeah. up. Yeah. He was so like mal- He was February. mentally ill, I think, right. for sure. Because he also took a hatchet to the children. Yeah, it's there was really like bad. was a really crazy thing going on. So that wouldn't fascinate you because it's clear cut. He's crazy. It's over, right? Yeah. No, so we, we, we want to get to the meat the, of new crime. You want somebody who was capable of appearing normal. It's more like there's a crime, and this is a whole other podcast, but there's a crime that is that is like the most unsolved crime in California history where this guy killed like 10 people and he's never been caught really? and he's left behind all these very weird specific clues like one time he brought a three-toed white German shepherd to the crime scene and I'm like how many guys out there had to have this dog so I'm like online at night looking at more, my husband's like what are you doing are you still in the cemetery site looking for the last names of the people who might own the dog oh my so gosh. I'm obsessed with finding him and he's the one that I well, just want to bring down could you check with veterinarians have you seen a, a I'm three-toed... doing everything I can I'm, did you, did you ask that? Do you, have you seen yes, a three-toned German yes, Shepherd? Yes. Yeah. Okay. No. I what think if that's the a three-toed question. German Shepherd owned him? <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a super intelligent dog. I have one more question. I don't want to hear your <laughs> theories, kid. Get out there and put some shoe leather into it. Listen, okay. we have to say we have to mention that your husband is one of our favorite comedians of all time. Oh, can you Pat should Noswald. you say that? Is yes, that appropriate? Yes, I asked yes. her. Yes, I asked her. Yes, Pat, Pat Noswald, Noswald is your awesome husband. Man. He's the voice of Ratatouille. He good man, is, good uh, man. You know, He's recently on been uh, Two and a Half Men. There's doing like a Two character arc on that. He was recently. King of Queens. He was King a regular. Queens. We used to do. You he know, was on the Christine Blackburn show, Hannes, 1999. No, 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 I know. He used to do all our open mics. He used to come to. He was. And he of course, did. he shot. He more, he's a little more successful than we are. But, yeah, a little um, bit. No, but that's exciting. I mean, yeah. he's a good guy. He was always yeah. so, and he's oh, he's so smart. Yeah. And it's around Easter now. And I always think about his bit about pause. He just bought it. He brought it into our house today. Yeah, and I and said, You brought that pause. because of the yeah. bit. And he was like, the I had bit to. bit is like something about, you know, we're paused, God damn it. You can't take it yeah, from us. Yeah, where the hell else are you going to get yeah. egg coloring? Where are you going to get egg dye? <laughs> we're paused. So yeah. Fuck and off. I know. I just saw it because I knew you were coming out. And I was like, Oh, and I saw him on Netflix. I watched one of his shows from. I'm going to guess 2004. He was talking about the origin of the city of Burbank. Oh. And I used to live in Burbank. <laughs> and so I had to. Wow, well, Hannes, that just, would definitely be in the. Uh, in no, the, it was hilarious the, because it was like, he was where, like, where a guy named Dave files? Burbank came out and said, can I make a town? They said, yes. End of story. And isn't it like, like it's, Dave oh. Burbank or something like that? Yeah, yeah. it is. That's no, right. it's Dave Burbank. And yeah. it really is. It's, okay. uh, there's well, no the story question. at all. One more question. Would you date a guy in prison? I mean, I'm not, um, I know you're married and happy. I'm and married and, and happy. happy. No, no, but I wouldn't. I would correspond. Have maybe. you ever written to people in prison? Um, that might no be a comment. new angle. <laughs> you, that, oh, <gasps> she has. She's written to people in prison. Are well, they just a number? No, no, no. It's just, it's more like it, when I want to get information, I have. Yeah. So what you do is on your, on truecrimediary.com, one of the headings is my prison friends. No, because that's like, I don't know. I don't Ladies want to like glamorize that. <laughs> I think it's very glamorous. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I do want to remind you that uh, Storyworthy is funded by listeners like you. What do you do, Honest? I don't want to hear about your fancy internet funding. What do you do, Honest? Well, I guess what you would do is you would click on our website and go to the donate page. That's right, storyworthypodcast.com. And if you can't donate monetarily, what you do is you head over to iTunes, you give us a good review. That helps iTunes. our show. You know, we used to collect the charts. shell casings back in my day. In my day, we wore an onion on our belt. Which was the fashion at the time. Hey, Michelle, would you like to play a little shotgun storyworthy? Sure. Okay, here's a good idea. Let's have her spin the wheel, Hannes, and whatever she lands on, she talks about it in the genre... Right, it's about like, true crime. It's hopefully crime. the topic will will bring forth a true crime story. Right. You know what the real crime is? That we stole this idea from Jorge Reyes, <laughs> our sound engineer. <laughs> All right, ready? That music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Story Worthy. The game show where contestants spin the story worthy wheel of truth. And tell a true one-minute story on the topic they land. So everyone, say it with me. Spin that wheel! Breakup. Well, breakups are the source of 90% of crimes, probably. 
Okay, here's what I'll say. The Martha Moxley case, the famous Kennedy, Martha yeah, Moxley, right? she was hit with the golf club in Greenwich, Connecticut. It, one of the Kennedys, I'm forgetting his name, it's Michael, I think is in jail for it. I actually would say that I'm not so sure that Michael Kennedy is guilty of that crime. The older brother had the real hots for her, and he's never been really like, the timeline with him has always been a little hinky. And Michael was quite a bit younger. And there's only like some weird reasons that Michael might be guilty for it. Like he said something like I was masturbating in a tree about her or something like that. But the truth is that I think the other brother who probably, it always comes back to love and being spurned and stuff like that. And I think he may have done. That's a good story. I want you to come back and tell a story called I was masturbating in a tree to you. <laughs> That's a whole other Because story. it's the tree part. I was masturbating to you is a pretty normal thing. I was in a tree. Yeah. That freaks me out. Michelle, I want to I wanna like do a seance with you or something, man. <laughs> Seriously, I want to like party horror with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got to wrap this up, but I'd like to thank Jorge Reyes, our sound engineer. Thank you, Jorge. Always prompt, always on time. And you're hearing us, aren't you? I'd like to thank our storyteller tonight, Michelle McNamara. That was McNamara. an uncomfortable silence. <laughs> and of course, you, Hannah Spinney, my dear friend. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story-worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. If you have a five-minute story that is worthy, send us an email at info at storyworthypodcast.com and you may be on the next Story Worthy. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Hi, it's Carl Deichler, CEO of Beachbody, and I'm giving away 10,000 free memberships a week to try our amazing Beachbody fitness and nutrition programs. Pick any program and just follow it step by step, like our 21-Day Fix program or the Ab Shredding Muscle Burns Fat program. Plus, there's free support in personalized fitness groups with our community of over 2 million members. Now is the time, so don't wait. Go to Beachbody.com to claim your free membership and start feeling great. Buy four tires and get up to $250 in savings after rebate at Bell Tire's 4th of July sale. Or get even more in Bell Tire gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Plus, get tires as low as $49 after rebate. Get up to $250 in savings. Or get even more in gift cards, June 20th through July 2nd. Get up to $250 in savings. Choose the lowest tire price, period, at Bell Tire. 100 years of getting folks safely back on the road, fast and affordably. See store at belltire.com for details. Restrictions apply.